Hello ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is uh, Vakar Hussain. Uh, by profession, I am a designer of computer systems and I have a 15 years of work experience. Uh, I did my master's and PhD from Finland from a university called Tampere University of Technology. And meanwhile, I had been to six months to one years of research visits in uh, in RWTH in Aachen in Germany and in University of Chicago. Uh, currently, I'm working in Nordic Semiconductor, which is which is a semiconductor manufacturing company uh, located in Trondheim in Norway. In Norway, I had been living for five years before that, uh, eight years in Finland, uh, and a part of that, and of course, as I told you, uh, I was on a research visit. So those were in Germany and in Chicago. So uh, this is all about me. Uh, today we are going to discuss uh, are computers just simple machines? Uh, the answer is yes or no. Uh, and today's lecture is not is not a high end lecture. It's all about I want to convey you how a computer works, and the explanation would be for a layman, for a common man who doesn't need to have a very thorough understanding of, of computers. We, all, uh, we are all users of computers because you all have cell phones. Uh, it doesn't have to be a smartphone. When a uh, Nokia phone from the early 2000s definitely has a computer in it, a very powerful computer. So uh, in, these, in, 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 in today's world, uh, even, a com even a processor or a computer which is in your cell phone is a very, very powerful computer. But today we, we are not going to discuss that powerful computer. We would just look at different components of that processor and uh, how does it work in a very simple way. Uh, so from, from your general knowledge, you know that a computer system consists of two parts, hardware and software. So these are two boards, two blackboards, and I would dedicate the right board to hardware. And I'll draw a line here. Sorry, it's drawn already, but maybe for uh, camera. It's not very clear, so let me draw draw it. And uh, we are going to discuss hardware here, and then software here. So. Let me draw a microprocessor here because it's a piece of hardware. So I would place microprocessor here. Microprocessor. So how does the microprocessor came into being, uh, the evolution of microprocessor? It's a very different subject, but today, I'm talking about the microprocessors that you have in your cell phones or in your desktop computers or in your laptops. They, uh, the microprocessor that we are talking about is technology independent. It, it, doesn't, it, can, it can be a Apple's microprocessor, it can be a microprocessor from Samsung or Intel or any other company that you want. But the basic philosophies are very fundamental, and they are uh, those concepts are shared 
by all technologies in, among, in the whole world. So we might, you might would have heard that microprocessors are logical devices. They think logically. And what is the simplest form of logic? Yes, but uh, common, yes, yes, thank you. So if I ask you a question, a very simple question, and expect, uh, we would not be taking questions for the next maybe 20 minutes, because I need to explain things, and then we would be open to questions. So the very simple question would have a very simple answer and a very, comp a very simple question would have an answer, either yes or no. So we say yes as one, and no as zero. So yes or no. And this one and zero, yes or no, makes the entire microprocessor. How? We can also say yes or no as on and off, like a switch. You have a button here. Let's suppose there is a button and I switch it on, the light turns on. When I switch it off, the light turns off. And so we have switches. In computers, these switches are called transistors. Transistors do an off, and we will come to the transistors, but since these computers, which have microprocessors, they are called computers. And what is the simplest form of computation? Let's say addition. nine plus seven, the answer would be 16. And if I want to represent nine in one and zeros, I can do it very fast, so we don't spend too much time. You can go back home and learn it. But let me write nine here. It would be in, in five bit form. Let's say if I want to do the representation of 9 in 5 bits, it will be 0, 0, 1, right? And if I want to represent, so let's say why 9, how come it becomes 9? These binary numbers, I will go a bit fast now. These binary numbers, when I place them here, their position is very important. So this is the position number 0. This is position number one, two, three, and four. Since we are talking about five bits, is this visible to the camera? So, and now if I want to get to know why this number represents nine, I would, because we are dealing with binary numbers, so base has to be two, two to the power zero, and this is two to the power one, two to the power two, three, Oh. Since I have written the positions already, I can write just two here. And then I have to look at these positions. And this is one. So that is two to the power zero is one. One multiplied by one is one plus this is zero so multiplication with any number who doesn't mean anything again zero so zero plus zero and two to the power three is eight and then again a zero because multiplication by zero with any number would lead to zero and this would turn into nine and the same logic would be seven this is seven, so this is two to the power zero, two to the power one, two to the power two, and then zero and zero, so we would see two to the power zero is one, two, four, and then you add it up. 
So it would make seven. And if I want to, so this is the basic form of computation I want to go through quickly. Let's take these two numbers and add them up, add them up in binary, and that would lead to And we are going to add them up. So 1 plus 1 is equals to? Yes. Why? Who said that? I think you can move faster because I've, people know all this. Uh, I can move fast, but I have to. Uh, I'm just going to finish this up by adding this. So that is 0, and carry is 1. So it would be 0 again, 0 again and then zero again and that this is one so this is position number zero one two three four and two to the power power four is 16 so you got 16 and this is the basic form of computation how a processor does the computation that is using these numbers okay zero and one and that's how we do the computing and that's why it is called a computer so i just kill this up and then we want to know how a switch works. The switch is a transistor, and the transistor, uh, this is what actually I thought about, so I just wanted to go systematically and tell them a little bit about transistor. So a transistor is a semiconductor device, and, and there are two types of transistors we had to go through. One is called a, a NMOS and a PMOS, and they go all in combination, and let me draw the diagram here. <clears throat> so let's say <clears throat> that this, this piece of semiconductor has a majority of majority of negatively charged carriers and and I create a doping region here. And and let's say the, the, there are lots of uh, here here this this substrate is is having a lot of positively charged carriers and these are heavily doped with n type material which is a negatively charged material and here is a here is a layer of silicon dioxide and there is a metal plate over it And uh, let's say this is the source, this is the drain. And we want to make a connection on and off between source and drain. And let's say this is five volts. When we would apply five volts positive, it would, it would pull up, it's a field effect transistor, so it would create an electric field. And because of that electric field, electrons would start depositing here, it would make up a channel. As soon as you apply, you, you start applying voltage from zero to five volts, the electrons would start, the minor, there, there would be some kind of impurities here, which would be ne negatively charged material, and it would start getting deposited here. It will make up a channel, and the conduction starts happening between this channel and this channel, so switch on has happened. One has happened. And uh, from source to drain, this is how it goes. So let's say if there is 5 volts here, when you would apply 5 volts here, this 5 volt would be available at this drain, from source to drain. Let's say that if I, so this, this transistor has a, has a width, has a height, and let's say this is another dimension, which is the length. With, it has a volume. So larger the volume, the higher the voltage I need to apply for conduction to happen. So you might would have seen that there is more functionality into your processors these days because the size, the dimension of these transistors is decreasing. We do not need to apply this 5 volts we can operate it at 1 volt, we can operate it at 0.7 volt, we can keep decreasing this voltage. 
So as the size of the transistor is decreasing, this, this volume, which, which shows that this voltage is directly proportional to this volume, as we are decreasing as we are decreasing the volume of the transistor the size of the transistor we are also decreasing the voltage because we do not need to have a higher operable voltage so you see the the battery time of your cell phones is increasing with as the technology is coming up so this is one factor and when you see that you decrease the let's say if i immediately apply instead of 5 volts, I apply 10 volts, I would be able to achieve this channel much faster. So if I decrease, if I keep this voltage 5 volt constant and, and I decrease the size of this transistor, I would be able to make a connection, logic 1, much faster in a smaller amount of time. So you see, when we are decreasing the size of the transistor, your, device, your, your microprocessor is becoming faster because using these transistors, we make microprocessors, billions and billions of such transistors. And there are multiple, many different types of transistors. We don't need to go into that detail. But this is called VLSI, very large scale integration. And so I have given you how a switch works. Now going from zero to one, like going from this yes or no answer, we go to a little more complicated uh, logic, which is I say yes, you say no. So an inverted logic. And we denote it by, by, this, by this element. You get apply one here, you get an output zero. You apply zero, you get an output one. Sorry, it's a not operation. And how we would make this, this gate using those transistors, it's a very simple form. We would have, a, we, what we saw was a NMOS before, and now we have a combination of that. So, so we have a NMOS that we just saw. And we have an opposite of that. So let's say if this is at, I would say it's called source voltage. So I would say it as five volts here. And this is your gate. You apply one here, then it conducts. But if one, if you apply one here, it stops. And let's say this is the V out, the output voltage. And this is the V in the input voltage. When you apply one here, which is five volts, this would start conducting, and this would stop conducting. And this is zero, which is ground. The output would be equals to zero. And if you apply zero here, this would stop conducting, this would start conducting, and you would have five volts at the output. This, this would stop conducting here, this would st start conducting. So this is like, this is like an OR gate, sorry, an, a NOT gate. And there are other forms of gates, other forms of logic, which is a bit more complicated, which is AND. So AND is denoted like this. If you have input A and input B and output C, so this would be A and B. If both are one, then the output would be one. If any one of them is zero, the output is zero. And there is an OR gate, which is, A and B. <clears throat> any one of them is one, the output is one. Okay, if both of them are zero, then the output is going to be zero. And then you can keep on adding different complicated gates all together and make up a very complicated you can you can have such gates so this is a way of way of communicating way of making functions when you would have complicated gates like this you can implement a complicated 
logic here. And you can, of course, using these transistors, you can make storage elements, which can store some values, which are called registers or flip-flops. So we would not go into those details, but what I have told you that how, why it is called a computer, because it does computing. And how it does computing, it computes by using very simple form of logic, which is ones and zeros. Ones and zeros work using transistors. And you have seen a simple transistor. And how we use a transistor to make a very simple logic like not, like this. So this is a combination of two transistors of opposite types. And using the same methodology, you can make gates like this. So our end gate would be like this. This gate closes, gate closes, then you would have the output. So this is what I wanted to tell you. So I would say, so let me draw another gate here, which is a NAND gate. So it would be an opposite of this one. Okay, A and B, if they are one and one true, the output would be zero. It, it works opposite of this. Okay, and then there's an exclusive OR gate A and B, and this is C, and this works like an adder. So I was adding bits together that you saw. So this, this can take one and one, the output is going to be zero, okay? And if it, it is zero and one, the output is one. So I would say that the microprocessor here the microprocessor here has this stuff in it. It has some, it has a functionality like this inside this microprocessor. So this microprocessor is supposed to do computing like and we did the add operation and there is, of course, a subtract operation. There is, of course, a multiplication and, and some arithmetic operations, some logical operations as well, like do the and of, let's say, five, two five-bit numbers or two eight-bit numbers or 16-bit numbers. Do the or of these two 16-bit numbers. The microprocessor is capable of doing it, but somebody has to tell the microprocessor that you should perform these instructions because these are instructions. Do add as an instruction, subtract as an instruction. So for that purpose, it needs to have a, it needs to have an instruction memory. So let's say this is an instruction memory, and this is the index of this instruction memory, and here are instructions. So these instructions, let's say there's an add instruction. There's an add instruction here. This is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's say it has five instructions. The first instruction would be, I would, let's say I would, I can say add. And then this is subtract, sub, mul, div, and let's say logical and instruction. And I have some mathematical complicated function to do. Let's say derivation. 
and that derivation can be done using these arithmetic and logical operations. I would not go into a detail how that would be, but uh, let's assume that a complicated mathematical procedure or a function can be implemented using very simple form of instructions. And how these instructions work, they work like this, that this microprocessor fetches these instructions one by one and performs computing. And one instruction, let's say it's a 16-bit instruction, it has 16 bits. So add, the instruction of add would be represented by a certain number of bits. Let's say four bits. So I would say four bits would tell you that this is an add operation if all of them are zero. Sub subtraction would be zero, zero, one. Multiplication would be two. Division would be, let's say, three. And AND operation would be 4. So now, in the instruction, in the 16-bit instruction, the leftmost bits, the first leftmost four bits tell us that it's what kind of operation we are going to perform. Then we need to have operands, that what are the numbers that we are going to perform addition operation on, or subtraction, or multiplication. So let's say we did we took those two five-bit numbers, which were seven and nine, and then the next b next b fields would be those operands. And let's say I can I can write them here. Okay, this is a bit getting a bit smaller, so I would write nine and then seven as the next two numbers. So this is to perform an instruction. Essentially, we need what kind of operation we want to perform, okay? And what on what operands we are going to perform the operation. And there, these can be other numbers like A and, and B. These are just binary numbers, C, D, E, F, G, H. These, these are other five-bit numbers. And this is it. Sir, how does the computer encode that the first four digits will be for the operation and the next six and six uh, bits will be for the operands. How is that encoded in the computer? We are coming this way. We are coming towards the software side, step by step. So for every different computer, let's say you have a, uh, well, in the whole world, in Apple, Microsoft, Samsung or Philips or whatever, like these microprocessors are in washing machines also. So when a microprocessor is given, is sold from one company to another company, let's say there's a company called ARM, its microprocessors are in, are in almost every embedded device, from smartphones to laptops to washing machines, smart thermometers, everywhere. So when, and there are different variants of microprocessors. So when a company is selling a microprocessor to another company, it tells, it's also, it also sells the instruction format. That how ad would be represented by which number of bits located in this instruction and where it would be located, what are the meanings of how you would decode an instruction what is an instruction set architecture? That is that, that those formats are also communicated so that the programmers or the users of those microprocessors can write these instructions. And this is called this is instruction formatting. It is different for every different processor. When you get to know this format, you can easily program this microprocessor. We are going, coming towards the software side slowly and gradually. So essentially, when you have these instructions, you know the instruction format, so you can see these ones and zeros in an instruction are 
actually written by a complicated software formatting technology, which we will discuss here. But software is actually ones and zeros. This is, these are electrons which flow over this microprocessor and does a job. So software is not something called uh, untouchable or let me say something ke, ke microprocessor ki ruh hai hai. It's not like that. It's no, no ru in it. It's, it's all ele electrons that flow over this microprocessor. So how come, so in old times, let's say in 1950s, when there were very simple computers who were doing this simple set of operations, people used to write it manually. First, write an instruction one by one, one after another, and then they would be loaded into the instruction memory in a very manual way. But right now, these days, we have assemblers, smart assemblers. And to a human, if like this instruction, let's say, these are five bits, five bits, and four bits, 14 bits, it's simple. I can extend two more bits, bits. But when you have to write millions of these instructions, humanly, it's not possible. So we need assemblers. And assemblers are basically translators, much like a translator of from English to Urdu, assembly, assembly, sorry, the assembler does kind of a translation that we are able to write a language using English like this. Like I would, I would expand this a bit, add, uh, we allocate uh, there is another thing called data, this is instruction memory, there is a data memory here. I don't want to go into a lot of details, but I think we still have 45 minutes. So let me have a data memory here. This, since we have a lot of instructions, and the instruction field the instructions are very complicated and their sequencing is also very complicated so we may would like some instructions to run before other instructions this this is this procedure is called jump uh, i'm not going to in that detail but i just want to say that these numbers are f are just five bits but for a higher precision to do a very very precise work we may need to go to 32-bit numbers or 64-bit numbers. Uh, a normal processor is 32-bit, and uh, there can be a 64-bit processor. Uh, there can be processors where multiple of these instructions are in parallel. Let's say a processor which flies from, from Earth to Mars would be a very complicated processor. So it would be working in floating point format, 64-bit floating point format, or they would have their own formats of data representation. We just saw two positive numbers getting added. We didn't see negative numbers getting added. We didn't see floating point numbers getting added. And that's an entirely different complicated work. We are not going into that detail, but since this is for layman, so here, here we have, this is the, I said this is an instruction memory. Instruction mem. And this is data mem. And it has, again, since it's a memory, it would have a address of every location like this 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 indexing. So it would be 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And it would have, let's say, a 32-bit number here. Uh, 
32 bit. So when I'm writing as a human, I cannot write these ones and zeros because it's going to make me mad. I'm going to write assembly language, which would be add. Dollar is like in assembly language, dollar means an address. And it would, let's say, add dollar one, comma, dollar three, subtract dollar. And, and then again, let's say two sources and a destination. So let's say dollar five. So fetch data from location number three and location number one, add, add it using the microprocessor, save the result back in location five here. So this is a simple add instruction. Then there can be a subtract instru instruction, which could be something like this, and then so on and so forth. So humanly writing stuff like this is easy. But since you have seen from early 90s, or okay, let's say from you were not born in 1970s, but you have seen that now you have so many apps. And there are so many apps in your cell phone that you can download, which are made by so many different companies. And of course, the productivity, then as the software is increasing, we see that working like this, like this is not really possible because of our productivity would go low. So there is an assembler. This assembler basically com compiles. Compiling is basically when you do compilation. If a person is a compiler, then he would take a folder, he will take different files, assemble in that folder, and arrange them in a nice way you know, or in a systematic way. So we say an assembler is, is a kind of a compiler which basically translates this, this instruction into binary numbers and put it into the instruction memory. And when you start your computer, this microprocessor would keep start reading these instructions one by one. It will do the job that you have asked for. But since the programming is becoming very complicated, we would like to write not in this format, but in a more human understandable format where the person doesn't need to really understand how these ones and zeros are working in microprocessors. So now you know that the software jobs are very different. You do not need to know much about computer electronics. But to really take the advantage of a microprocessor to maximize or to take the benefit of all the resources, you should know the architecture of the microprocessor and how these ones and zeros are going to work on it. This is called low level programming. This is not like humiliating work, but this is like a high skilled work. We say low level doesn't make it low level at, uh, from a social point of view. Low level level programmers are extremely highly paid and they are, the, they are very few people. But software guys are much more because they do not need to know electronics about microprocessor. But then when we talk like a language, we, there comes the languages. This is assembly is also a language. This is assembly language. And we have other forms of languages. The one step up is C, C language or C++, where we write more of a way that how humans communicate with each other, like if this, else, or, OK? So we can write if A is equals to B. So there can be equals means like there can be a comparison instruction here, comp, where it would, let's say, say that if uh, $3 and $4 are equal, fill $5 with all ones, 32-bit ones. 
So yes, if A is equals to B, perform these instructions, these arithmetic instructions, else perform these instructions. And then this kind of a language, which is more humanly understandable, you can For this language, there would be a separate compiler. That compiler would be called a C compiler, C language compiler. And every language has its own compiler, whose job is eventually to generate code for assembler. So this C compiler, which is a higher level language, which is more humanly understandable, you can do much more complicated work you can generate instructions like these and it is the job of the C compiler and then the assembler would convert into this and then you can have so this is one piece of code there can be several pieces of code like this existing around it and when you have written this piece of code in this, in these lines, there can be another if or else. Here can be another if or else. And then when you would have if and else's, you would ask some piece of this program, P1 to run, this P2 to run, P3 to run, P4, P5, and P6. So you can have several different program, pieces of programs that you want to run. But sometimes it's too hectic for you to decide or you, it's too complicated for you to look that either all of these programs are getting their chance to run over this microprocessor and here the operating system comes into play. You can have multiple programs run since there is one single processor here so you can have, you have multiple apps in your phone which are running, so you might be listening to music as well as you are driving, so you need Google Maps. So both need to have a chance to get resources of this microprocessor. So that scheduling of different programs is done by the operating system. So operating system occupies a certain certain memory in this instruction memory and maybe in data memory also I don't want to go into that detail but when you turn on the microprocessor the operating system loads up because that's the governing body that's the governing body of this microprocessor it would decide which of these pro programs has higher importance or of, crit or of critical nature okay so let's say if you are flying an aircraft from Pakistan to London or to New York, you, na you need navigation all the time. You cannot shut off na navigation. So the microprocessor knows that navigation has the highest importance. So that would get it. And the microprocessor would need it, would know about it. And there are different kinds of operating systems. Some are of critical nature, some are of uh, use for general public. The operating systems that you have are, are, uh, do not, are not of like, uh, they do not care much that each program has to finish its job, but there are operating systems which, which make sure that every program, when it gets its resources, the final results are achieved. So those are time critical operating systems and those are in uh, critical natured applications. So we have covered starting from why a computer calls a computer and what are the basis of computing using 
very simple form of logic, which is ones and zeros, and how ones and zeros perform computing. And uh, when you have computing, how to do a lot of computing like this, and how to assemble much more computing, like hundreds of these instructions, and how to have millions of these instructions using a higher level of language. And when you have, when you have made a small program, you can have multiple programs. And those programs would get their chance to run over microprocessor using a governing body, which is called an operating system. So this is it. This was my lecture all about. And uh, I'm, this is how a computer works in the most simplest way. And if you have any questions about it. Are you going to talk to dogmas, fallacies, and pitfalls? Yeah, that's, that's nice, actually. So uh, when I go around and people ask me, where are you from? And uh, what do you do for a living? Then I tell them that I design microprocessors. And they say, it's a magic. And uh, magic mostly works uh, when the magician who is an authority, he tells you, this is how it works. And don't ask me questions. So that's an authority telling you, I'm selling you Do lakh rupega cell phone. And it's going to work. It's from Apple. It's a reputed company. Don't ask me because so that's a dogma. Policies. Policies are basically uh, policies are concepts which lead you to false reasoning. False reasoning that starting from ones and zeros. And coming back here, or coming starting from this higher level language, you know that you are not going to be using this lecture. You know from, from start, the starting point to the end point. You know the reasoning that how a software gets decomposed into these ones and zeros. And uh, among that, we know that software is not untouchable thing. It's something very physical thing, like hardware. Among pitfalls, I would say that I didn't discuss those. I can say something about pitfalls also. Pitfalls are basically, pitfalls are events which can lead to a dangerous situation. Dangerous situation can be, for example, that you were running two or three applications, applications on your phone, and your phone hangs. And you cannot restart it. You are pressing the restart button for like two minutes. It's not restarting. It's, it's in a hanging state. And it happened to me once with my S10 device. I slept, I was ha over with, with, no, sorry, before sleeping, actually. And tomorrow I had an important day because my alarm was set in there. I had to wake up early. And now my, I, I'm, I'm helpless. My phone is, is, a, is in a hanging state. And it is not getting restarted. And the only option for me is this that its battery drains out and it becomes dead. Then I will charge it again and then the microprocessor would start reading the instructions again, load the operating system and start doing, start work. So this is kind of a pitfall. Where does the pitfall happen? I can tell you one very simple example. You have an add instruction and a subtract instruction and a multiplication. The multiplication instruction is would need, let's say, uh, I need to extend this instruction a bit. And here I would write the 
destination address A, B, C, D, E, F. And let's say this is generating E, this is generating F, and this is generating G. Let's suppose that A and B produces the result and stores it in E, C and D produces the result and stores it in F. And now E and F is required by multiplication, sorry, this division operation. Okay, I'm not, so let's say this is 0, 1, no, no. I would say this is add operation, this is subtract, and this is multiplication. So here's the multiplication. So multiplication needs results from the first two instructions. And let's say the first two instructions are not able to complete. And, and when these two instructions are not complete, are not able to complete because of some physical issue, then the multiplication operation cannot happen. And then your microprocessor would get in a, in a state of uh, holding, or like I would say, it cannot proceed further. This is a pitfall. It's a hazard. And it's a very typical situation in microprocessors where the results of previous instructions are not complete and the subsequent instructions are waiting for the results. And there are special, so I have not discussed the internal architecture of a microprocessor, but this is, this is like dependency, it's called data dependency. The previous instructions have to do certain job in a timely manner, and uh, the subsequent instructions do not have to wait. So this is one, one example of a pitfall. So I have been using Apple phone for the last two years and that situation hasn't happened. So maybe they have a better machine. Uh, sir, how are, micro, how are these transistors fabricated? Uh, like on oh. the microchip, how is that process achieved? Millions of yeah. transistors. Yeah. So uh, this is, I would say, uh, when you go in high school, there is a there is a strong bifurcation between you adapt pre-engineering and pre-medical. The good thing is that you study chemistry in both of these in both of these uh, selections. So there are chemical processes involved. Uh, there are two foundries in uh, main foundries in the world. One is called TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. How we design microprocessors, my last 15 years of work experience is about designing microprocessors, the hardware. And when we, we have, again, uh, scripts where we describe how a microprocessor should take its shape, and when we have decided, we, have, uh, we, we sit as a team together, different departments work with each other, and we first, we discuss the requirements and we assemble those requirements and then we start making a general map of the microprocessor and we give it to a different team, which is the synthesis team, and then they synthesize our scripts into into those transistors. It's uh, again a kind of a placement and routing mechanism that let's say this is the room here and we have placed chairs here. So some of some millions of transistors will occupy this space. Some millions of transistors would occupy this space. This space is for memories and these are the spaces for interconnections, highways, small streets which would connect different transistors together. This is called synthesis mechanism. When we have this kind of a road map we send this roadmap to those foundries. That's in Taiwan, or to global foundries in Dresden in Germany. And they give us first few prototypes. We test those prototypes in our laboratories, either they are working fine or not. So coming back to your question, we select foundries. 
first we select the foundry. You saw I was talking about the size of the transistor. In old times, like 20 years back, it was the one, the, the height, length, and width of that transistor that I was talking about that, is, that decides the foundry. 20 years ago, it was 130 nanometer. Then it came to 90 nanometer. Then it came to 45 nanometer. Then it went to 28 nanometer. At 22 nanometer, I'm working these days, but many other companies have shifted to 14 nanometer to seven nanometer. So let's say that if I want to fill up this microprocessor with transistors, and let's say this dimension, this size, let's say it's a 2D transistor. So let's say this is two inches. This is two inches. So in four inch square of a transistor, if I talk about a transistor which, is, which has a length and the width and the height of 130 nanometer, let's say I'm going to fix X amount of those X million transistors on those. But if I'm decreasing the size of the transistor, which means I can have more functionality in this microprocessor, I can go to 90 nanometers, then I would be able to pack more transistors in it. Then it is going to go to, if I go to 40 nanometer or 28 nanometer or 14 or seven, the size of the transistor is, is shrinking and it's Morris law. You all know that. Yes, that I, my next question was about that. Yeah, what so is your opinion on Moore's law? It's uh, going to fail soon because we cannot go, we cannot go below maybe one nanometer. And then there are quantum computers, things which are very much into academia. Some prototypes are developed, have been developed and have been tested. Uh, I was reading that a four bit quantum computer, which does this kind of a simple computing has been tested. But industry has its own vested interests. If I'm, if I'm an investor, or if I own an industry, or if I'm, if I'm an engineering manager in an industry, and if I see that if I, if I have sufficient functionality being implemented using 22 nanometer of a transistor, and I still have a lot of space left, I can still pack more transistors. I, why I would like to decrease or go for a smaller transistor, which is more expensive. Because, that, because let's say this TSMC or Global Foundries, they give us libraries of transistor technology. And we use those libraries to synthesize our designs that we make in companies. And when we synthesize using those libraries, then we send, send, send it to their foundries and they give us the first few prototypes that we test. And after then they can deliver thousands, or maybe hundreds and thousands of those devices. They can be doing wireless communication. They can be doing Bluetooth. Bluetooth is of course part. They can be a graphics processing unit. It can be a general purpose processing unit. It can be a digital signal processing unit. So it depends. But coming back to your, <laughs> your question, that how does it being manufactured? So what they do is basically, I'm not an expert of that because I'm not working in those foundries and those chemical, I don't know about those chemical processes, but it's most likely that take, take up a substrate of an N-type material, let's say a big substrate, and then they do chemical and physical processes like photolithography, where basically they dry up certain areas of it. So they shine a beam of light on it and dry them up. So I was talking about that this is a, this is a, there were two channels that you saw in the transistor and this is the substrate and I want to make up a NMOS here. So I will do photolithography over this area, this area, this area. And when this is dried up, I will do etching. Etching is another chemical process where you are able to remove. When this has dried up, it's, easy, it's easier to remove those things. And then I can do iron, iron implantation, 
which is called doping that I would, if this is a N type substrate, I can deposit P type material here. Okay. And then when this is done, ion implantation, there are very sophisticated techniques that I'm not really, that I don't know much about. But when you have made these transistors, then there are, then they are, then you can make metal connections among, let's say this is source, this, in, this here is another transistor located, so you will make metal connections over it to make connections, let's say to make up a complicated, this kind of a logic. And when you have done it, so much of your functionality, if it has implemented, you deliver it back to your, uh, to your customer. And these days, uh, this is a two-dimensional picture. So let's say if I make it like this, of course, nothing is two-dimensional. So the, let's say this is one, one layer of, one layer of, let's say, one million transistors. You can stack them up like a sandwich, and then it would become a 3D layer. So you can have, you can pack, you can connect a transistor, which is here. You can, you can make a metal connection between this source, which is here, and this pin here. And there are these connections are like spaghetti connections. You can think of them as spaghetti connection, but they are very, very much more like Islamabad highways and uh, service lanes and uh, connections between them. So these are sectors which are being defined. Then there are uh, la then then there are highways and small lanes. So highways very fast. Can uh, the highways are faster, as you know that they are wider. So much more like basic physics is like. If the wire, uh, if the wire is like this, uh, so if the length of the wire is longer, the resistance is longer, is higher, and if this area, which is, if this is, area is larger, resistance is higher. Resistance, resistance would be lower. 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 So we can have thicker wires mm. for making global connections. This is a global connection because this is from one end to another end, but. If the connection is very local, then you can have smaller wires. Mm -hmm. Using smaller wires, you save money because gold is expensive. These wires are made of gold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And sir, uh, uh, we know that nowadays uh, the success of machine learning has been enabled by. Sorry, what? The success of machine learning and. This is very complicated uh, question. Me, I have a, a hardware Wait, level question. No? Yeah, okay. So, uh, the success of machine learning and neural nets has been enabled by the introduction of GPUs, graphics yeah. processing units. Yeah. Uh, whereas before uh, they weren't that widely available yeah. or nobody hit upon the idea. Yeah. But since their introduction into the hardware, yeah. uh, we've been able to train our models on very large data sets yeah. and achieve very high processing speeds. Yeah. So what is the difference between GPUs and uh, the normal microprocessors? That's a very high level question. I like these questions because teaching to a, teaching in kindergarten or school is the most difficult job. Uh, I was lecturing for eight or nine years in Finland and then two years in Norway. And I was teaching to masters and PhD. So that was really easy. And this, what I have explained here is a very difficult job because to explain to a layman is very difficult. But since your question, coming back to your question, AI is, is now a buzzword and it's, it's getting popular, it's used and it's, uh, it's, uh, it, ha it has started yielding its results because we, we, we have seen uh, electric cars which are using artificial intelligence. Human intelligence is what we have, but if we can replicate this human intelligence into a microprocessor and it's able to do it, it's called artificial intelligence. GPUs, this one very specific example that I've explained, it's a, of a general purpose processor. A processor which is very cheap and it's common for everyone. GPUs are very expensive, why? Because GPUs, this microprocessor that I just explained has one arithmetic and logic unit, only one. 
but GPUs have an array of arithmetic logical units working in parallel. And ELU is a very expensive thing. And if you're talking about for those, for, for, for training a neural network, you need a lot of algebraic operations, a huge matrix vector multiplication or a huge matrix matrix world multiplication. And if you are doing inner product on a huge, let's say matrix, let's say if the matrix row and length is 256, 256 here, and the other is also 256, 256, and you want to multiply these two matrices, there would be a huge amount of multiply and addition operations. This would take maybe years and years of that. And GPU, since, has a lot of hardware units, hardware mathematical units available to you, which are of 64-bit. They can do invariably addition, multiplication, subtraction on large floating point numbers. So you can implement those. And since our transistor size is decreasing a lot, so these uh, neural networks and artificial intelligence algorithms, they were existing from 1960s. But we are able to implement them efficiently. Why? Because we have the size of the cell phone is almost the same, but every year we have a higher performance. Why? Because our transistor size is decreasing and we are able to pack more transistors here. We have efficient software side also developing. So uh, that's, that's the answer to your question that AI is now possible because we can make more transistors here and we can have more arithmetic and logical units Several of them working in parallel. No, sir. Last question. Uh, a question was. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, these microprocessors and uh, these devices also use a lot of rare elements as well, which are For quite. Uh, there are examples I don't have any in mind, but I've uh, right now. But I have read articles uh, that they have to extract these from specific locations in the world, often in underdeveloped countries, and they also leads to also a lot of exploitation of those countries yeah. uh, because uh, constructing these cuttings or devices requires those rare elements. I can look it up right now. Yeah. Uh, so do companies like yours have any like plans, future plan, because uh, these ores will soon run out. They are not like unlimited because they, these are very rare elements. So do companies like yours have any future plans, long-term plans uh, regarding the extraction of these elements? Because if they run out, then the current architectures that you are using won't really be possible. So I'm not, have uh, today I'm not speaking on behalf of my company where I work. And it's a question of political nature. So I can, I can answer it from my own. Uh, I, I really do not know what kind of, because as I told you that I'm the architectural and the implementation designer of these microprocessors. We designed this and we send it to TSMC in Taiwan, which is now having an issue with China because of Nancy Pelosi visit. Mm -hmm. And China is very angry and they are doing the blockade and they have the gold mine there, which is TSMC. And you, you know that there is a chip shortage all, all across the world. So it's not only the material which is being used, and I'm not really sure of the material, but of course, to do so much of chemical processes like etching, uh, iron implantation, there are so many gases which are being made, which are being massively produced in Russia or elsewhere. Okay, and there is a supply chain, which is because these, when these in a in a huge, huge manufacturing plant, there are pipeline stages. Okay, I am receiving, I am receiving the floor plan from different companies and I'm gonna give it to another guy. There is, there is uh, etching happening, there is iron implantation happening, there is connections happening, there is uh, packaging happening and if one stage of the pipeline misses out, it costs billions of dollars of uh, of loss. So let's say if the supply line was continuously being supplied from Russia and now it is disrupted, 
and now the, that, uh, that, that factory has to look for resources for gases or for uh, chemicals somewhere else, they need time. And then, the, then there's uh, the supply and demand chain which gets disrupted and the prices are soaring up for electronic gadgets. And you might would have seen in NASDAQ the, st the stock prices of different uh, uh, blue, blue chip companies uh, they have they have received a lot of loss. Uh, so you mentioned magic, and there's no being soul in the computer. Uh, but whatever we have discussed so far is after the computer boots up. But what gives the computer life in the first place when we push the power button? Because at that stage there is no software working, there is nothing going on. But yeah. still, there is something that brings it to life. Yeah. What's that starting point? That's a very good question. So this, this thing is called firmware. We have discussed uh, instruction memory. We have discussed data memory. And there is, a, there is another memory which is called firmware memory. It is located somewhere here. There was no point in writing because I couldn't write anything in here. But here's a firmware here. This firmware has some instructions like this, and they cannot be changed by anyone. They, it's, a, it's a memory which is not erasable. You cannot access that memory as, even as a user of this microprocessor. This, this firmware have addresses, hard code addresses, which would always point to the start of the instruction memory where, which would load the operating system in the first place. Uh, but there still would be a point when that transistor or that device didn't have the firmware. Like we need to install the firmware at some no, point. No, in no, the you don't need to. It, firmware means firm. It's firm. It, it is built in since the from device the factory. Was the, from... It's built in from the factory. Right. Yeah, it, it cannot be changed. So it's, it's there always. So something has to be hard coded. It cannot be changed. But then the rest is all flexible. So the slowest part of the computer is the slowest chip. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay, now let me ask, is it necessarily the case that if you reduce the size of the chip, of the computers, go to 24 nanometers or below, that uh, the speed will keep increasing because the distances are shorter? Or um, is it that, um, is the speed dependent upon how much power you put into this? More power gives you more speed? Yeah. What is, what determines the speed of yeah. a computer? Yeah. Uh, so you can drive it with a clock, but there's a certain maximum beyond which it will not respond to the clock. Yeah. I can, I can answer your question piecewise. First you talk about, uh, so there is one, uh, when I go to different uh, conferences, people talk about l performance. And if we talk in a holistic way what performance is, performance is not actually if let's say if you're driving a car, it's not all about how fast the car is going. It's also about how much fuel it is consuming when you're putting in the gas and how much mileage, how much far you can reach. So these are all the metrics of performance. In today's lecture, since we, we were trying to address it in a very basic way, we, we just said that the speed or the performance is really to the size of the transistor. So this is one way of looking at it. But since the devices are very complicated, we have many different forms of memories. These memories that I have talked about, instruction memory and data memory, these are very close to the processor. So there is something called clock in a processor, as Professor Hudbhai has mentioned. And this clock is like a square wave. If you look at it's like a square wave. And if you look at it in a 
uh, this is mostly generated if you look at a printed circuit board a very simple printed circuit board which is doing a very simple operation it would have a crystal on it and crystal has a constant frequency and it is generating a clock like this but in reality if you look at with a high resolution microscope it's it it's like up a rising and a, a rising and a damping sine wave uh, components uh, because no signal can be like this because here the slope is zero and it's not possible so no the slope is infinity the so it's not, it's not a possible signal but this clock when you have the rising edges here an instruction gets fetched this is an ideal situation but we have memory hierarchies these are the closest to the microprocessor so these are the register files on top of that there is a cache memory which is slower than these ones but larger than these ones smaller is always faster that is the rule of the thumb so the smaller the memory the closer to it to the microprocessor every clock cycle every clock edge you will be able to fetch one instruction caches are larger but slower because they are made with a technology which is less expensive this is the most expensive one because these are all flip-flops nearly flip-flops which are very close to the microprocessor so at every clock edge they are going to fetch one instruction but caches are bigger and when you have the assembler those instructions first come to the cache then it comes to the microprocessor sorry toward, towards these register files and before cache there is ram that you know that you can see physically cache is still inside the microprocessor packaging the thing that you see on pcb the microprocessor the cache is still there but rams you can see outside and then there is a disk the disk which is 40 gb or these days it may be 300 gb or 1 tb ssd drive is common so when you have it so when you switch on your computer uh, the main operating system is is residing in the ssd like the one terabyte of memory then it goes to ram then it goes to cache and then it goes to the register file and initially when you start up the computer all these memories are empty so these are cold messes uh, cache says i don't have data it tells to the ram ram tells i don't have data then it goes to the main uh, uh, main hard drive or the disk so the data keeps filling in and then it reaches so performance so one form of perform one form of increasing the performance as uh, professor hudbai has asked is to have a nicer or a more efficient memory hierarchy structure so let's say if uh, i can i i can just so here is the register file which is let's say the instruction memory imem instruction memory then you have cache and then you have ram and then you have disk the main memory which is like when you buy a cell phone it tells you they tell you it has a 64 gb memory so you buy with these specs actually so this is uh, main uh, main mem and when you have this when we, you start and this instruction memory is then the cache it is going to request cache if the cache doesn't have it would request the ram and then if ram doesn't have this data it would request request the main memory 
So data is going to fill up step by step here. And now the computer has started. And since, let's say that five to 10 different applications have started running all together. And so what we discussed was the boot up sequence. Now we, now our processor is in a steady state and we have four or five different applications programs running here. So if we, if we know already in advance with some method that certain instructions would always be fetched, we can always place them in cache. Things which it is called, uh, this technique is called least, uh, most, uh, uh, okay, uh, most recently used mechanism. The, the, the things that you frequently use, you always keep them in cache, not in memory, so that the fetching time is, it is available to the processor more readily. So let's say if I'm a Google Maps user, a frequent user of that, and my phone is switched on for the last and it has not lost its battery. Then the data which is, or the instructions which are related to Google map would be nearly kept here so that it is, it comes to the processor very fast. So maybe you would have observed in your laptops or desktop computers that uh, let's say if you're using Microsoft Word a lot and your computer hasn't switched off, and you double click on it on the icon, it opens up quite fast. But let's say if there is a program that you haven't used in the last seven days, it would take a little more time to load and come up to your screen. So performance is also not only reducing the size of the transistor or packing more transistors into a microprocessor, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger, it's a more holistic approach when you deal with it. So it's about uh, mem arranging memory hierarchy or uh, dealing with an efficient way of cache misses. You miss, you miss the data here and then you fetch it from the RAM. So there is, uh, there, there is a separate mechan mechanism for it. And let me, you can of course, you can of course, uh, I drew the clock here. You can, of course, increase the clock frequency. So this is one way of doing it, but you, there are limits of doing it also. Yeah, we, that's a very different, that's another topic if we would like to go into, because uh, if, let's say, if this AND gate output gets connected to this and this gets connected to this and so now the signal propagation from this point A to point C here would take a lot of time. And if there are register elements here which are going to store uh, this, this kind of a, this logic is called combinatorial logic and this is called sequential logic when you have registers here. So let's say this is also registered here. So the clock basically drives, this is clock. When you have something like this here, this is called clock. And this is clock. So when a clock comes, clock edge comes here, this data which is A and B, it goes into D, into this, uh, sorry, in this AND gate and then it starts propagating here and with the same clock edge this is the first clock edge uh, sorry this is the next clock edge and this is the time period inverse of that is frequency so these this is the first clock edge 
In the first clock edge, the data is available here and starts coming here. And before the next clock edge, the data should be available here at this point. And if I'm connecting a lot of this logic together, I need more time, which means my frequency would decrease. But if I have a smarter logic, if I'm smart and if I'm able to do my derivation or integration with fewer number of these arithmetic operations, the numerical analysis technique, it's a separate chapter. And those techniques are very, have been existing from 1950s. But if I'm able to do this, this kind of mathematics in a very, with small number of instructions, I can reduce this time and therefore increase the clock frequency and I'm able to do much faster proce processing. At the level of uh, individual transistors, I would like to uh, f uh, understand about that. Are these uh, gates, all the adds, uh, subtraction, or the and nor gate, are those hard coded and physically? Uh, physically embedded on the system? Matlab wo uska, uh, uh, are they part of the machine or do they become the AND gate and the NOR gate through the instructions? Ya ye hoga ke AND gate itne certain number of AND gates jo hain wo microprocessor ke andar uh, uh, matlab uska part hain physically. Physically part hain. Physically part hain. Physically part hain. Certain number of AND gates are there, certain number of OR gates I would are say, there. When you would say certain, I would say maybe 10, 20, but these are millions of transistors. Right, right, right. Okay. So uh, uh, these uh, millions of transistors are physically present here. Right, a few million of AND gates are present on each mic microprocessor. Yeah, you can and say. And a few uh, million of OR gates. Maybe, and a few million maybe of 20 other. years ago. Right, right, right. Yeah. And how many uh, different types of gates are there, sir, total? Uh, I have told you a few, few types of gates. These are mostly logical gates, AND, OR, NOR, exclusive OR, and then so on and so on. There, there are there may be, I cannot say a word, but right. easily 16 to 20 <coughs> different logical operations are there. And if you feel comfortable, how does this uh, uh, entire thing change? Uh, in the quantum computers, if you could just touch up on that oh. at the micro level, at the level of individual transistors, I would uh, I would be a bit hesitant. So, Professor Hudbay can correct me about it. There are quantum gates which are like these, but they have the same number of inputs as outputs, so they're not exactly the same as that. So, the gates that switch the phase, uh, something called the Toffoli gate, which uh, um, does a kind of matrix multiplication. Um, so it's not one to one over here. And what do they work on, sir? Uh, these we understand physically. Oh. Like AMOS, uh, CMOS, and the other. So these would use either electrons or they would use photons. Photons are much more used these days. So the lecture that we had uh, three days ago or so that uh, indicated that uh, you could use photon polarization. That's principally what is used to separate up from down, zero from one. One polarization is zero, the other is a one. And then a qubit is a linear combination of up and down. Yes, please, online. Yes, please. What's the online question? It, it appears to be pseudonym, but well, Stalwart Neophyte says uh, there are many questions by him. First one is uh, what's the difference between MediaTek and Snapdragon processor? Why Snapdragon is more popular and in demand? I don't know about it. Uh, the, the other question is continuation of that. Uh, yeah. uh, why and how are 9nm Snapdragon is better than 11nm Snapdragon processor? How size reduction is impacting the processing speed? How? Uh, how the size reduction is impacting the processing speed? Uh, I think we explained a lot here, mm -hmm. but I can say this, that when you s decrease the size of the transistor, you need, uh, 
uh, you can operate it faster, okay? You can make the switching on and off faster if you decrease the size of the transistor and you keep the operating voltage the same. So this is one factor, okay? So you, and also the size of the transistor is like you reduce the size of the transistor, you are able to pack more transistors over the same, same area. And you have seen that the size of the cell phone has not increased, but the function a lot of functionality, which means that a huge number of being, transistors are being packed more than previously in the same area. So this is, this is one answer of it. I cannot do the, I do not really know because this is so complicated stuff. I cannot compare a processor of one company with another company without looking at the instruction architecture, what better than the other. And it's a, it's a, it's a job of maybe a few months for, for an outsider who is not working in those companies. Next question from him is how a processor which is compatible with Windows 10 is not compatible with Windows 11 and uh, who will be responsible for those processors eventually going to junk? Because of this instruction set architecture it changes. Okay, Windows 11 might be generating different instructions here which are not understood by this processor. And this is how, uh, but you, 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 the, many companies basically when they release operating systems for a certain processor family, they are always backward compatible. So, so let's say if new instructions are not there, they would like to, let's say this multiplication operation can also be performed by several add instructions, okay? So this is backward compatibility and, but at some point of time when you are going up and up towards a higher end processor, you need to upgrade the software also, operating system and the programs. The last question is uh, from the same stalwart neophyte. Uh, he asks, the read write speed on HDD is way less compared with SSD. Uh, then why HDD are still in the market in, in the marking, why we haven't shifted completely to SSD? Because we would also like to serve people who are living with old technology, who love their old computers, and may would not like to afford a new computer. So they do not want to make them, make them feel uh, deprived, okay? So it's just like, just supporting its backward compatibility. So this is it. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.